Okay. Well, it looks like we have uh, ignition and we can blast off. <laughs> Welcome everyone to Brainstorming the Human Connection, brought to you by the South Dakota Humanities Council. And this is an interactive program. The whole point is to explore subjects that are often, you know, not talked about or, and sometimes it's just because they're difficult to talk about, but often just because they're just underneath our radar, we don't think about them. And, you know, look, we can't think about everything, but we can think about some different things. And that's what we hope to do is to bring you some of the things that you might not have been aware of or maybe aware of, but haven't had a chance to really get under the hood and find out about them really. So uh, we invite you to join us in this conversation. We'll spend the first uh, 15 or 20 minutes just talking about our subject, but then we'll be, be inviting you to join us and we hope that you'll have questions, comments, et cetera, and join in the conversation. That's when the rubber meets the road. Often when we think about uh, Native culture, we don't really think about the role that uh, Native women play and have played historically. And a lot of it because, you know, what you don't know, you don't know, and you don't know you need to know. But uh, a lot of it is because, you know, it was kind of written out of, uh, sort of obscured from us. And today we're going to explain like what those roles have been, what they are now, what, what are you know, Native women doing now? And of course, when we say Native women, we realize that every person isn't doing this, but you know, we're making a composite Native woman and, and including all of those so that we get a kind of a round view. Otherwise, it's, if we talk about it, each person, then I don't know how much meaning that would have in terms of a conversation. But we're going to be talking about uh, Native women with Sarah Hernandez, who is the author of We Are the Stars, Colonizing and Decolonizing the Oshete Shakoin uh, Literary Tradition. And welcome, Sarah. Hi, Lawrence. Thank you so much for inviting me today. Let's first talk about who Sarah is, where you, where you were born, how you grew up, yeah. You know, like what kind of disco music you like, you know, <laughs> all the important stuff. <laughs> okay, so um, my name is Sarah Hernandez and I'm Sichangu Lakota. Um, my parents, or my grandparents are John Flood from Oak Creek, South Dakota, and Leona Colomb, who's from White River and um, Valentine. And my mom is Cynthia Flood. She was born and raised on the Rosebud Reservation. Um, my dad is Samuel Hernandez, and he is from Jalisco, Mexico, and my parents met in California, which is where I was born. Um, I lived in California until I was about four, and then our family moved to Denver, Colorado. And so I was primarily raised in Denver. Um, I didn't grow up on the reservation. I, of course, would visit, you know, family and relatives in the summer and for holidays, but I, that's very different than, you know, living on the reservation. And so I'd visit the reservation once a year. Um, but I primarily grew up in Denver and I attended predominantly white schools. And, you know, in these schools, I never had the opportunity to learn about my language or my culture in any way. And so when I went to college and I started going to graduate school, I made a really conscious and deliberate effort to start learning more about Native American literature in general, but Ocheti Shakuin literature specifically. And so I wanted to learn more about tribal writers from my own community. And so that really has been, um, you know, my main career goal. That's as an assistant professor at the University of New Mexico, my research again focuses on Native American lit, but specifically Dakota, Nakota and Lakota literature. And so I was really fortunate um, during my graduate studies to come across the Oak Lake Writer Society, which is a first of its kind tribal writer group for Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota writers. And so hopefully a lot of your audience members are already familiar with Oak Lake. Um, but I've been a part of Oak Lake for almost 10 years. Um, our mentors are Dakota scholar Elizabeth Cooklin, um, Charles uh, Charles Woodard, who I see is online today, um, Lowell Amiot. These were our mentors for a long time. 
And, um, you know, they had a really profound impact on my scholarship and my personal life. And so I'm really grateful uh, for the Oak Lake Writers Society for helping me reconnect um, with Ochatishakwin culture and literature. And so I'm really grateful for that experience. Let's talk then about your book because your book is uh, sort of encapsulates our subject today. Um, mm -hmm. Tell us yeah. about this, this cover. That's a very interesting cover. Yeah, I'm actually really proud of the cover of that book. Um, it was designed my, by my brother, Ruben Hernandez. Um, he's a graphic, you know, graphic design artist. And so my book, it began, began as my dissertation project. And when I was doing all of this research for the dissertation, um, and then later for the book, I had this really clear image in my mind of what I wanted to see on the cover of the book. And so I asked my brother, I said, can you design the cover for me? And I said, I want it to be ledger art um, because traditionally ledger art is um, considered um, resistance, you know, an act of resistance. Um, it's always been, you know, considered by indigenous people as an act of resistance. You take US documents, financial documents, legal documents, and you um, paint indigenous pictures over those financial documents, legal documents. And so when I started writing this book, I started looking at the treaties that were used to dispossess um, Dakota people of their ancestral homelands. And some of the early missionaries translated these treaties in the Dakota language, but they mistranslated these treaties. Um, and so I knew I wanted to use these mistranslated treaties as the background of the book, as a reminder of how you know, um, missionaries and the federal government colonized our people. And then I wanted to superimpose images of three Ocheti Shakuin women on the book. And each of these women represent the Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota nation. And if you look closely at their shawls, their, um, you know, their shawls have stars on them. And that's symbolic of the star narratives and the land narratives that have guided our people since time immemorial. And so this book is really a literary recovery project where, um, you know, I try to um, reclaim and help revitalize our, our stories. Um, you know, the Ocheti Shakuin have a long and rich literary tradition that has existed since time immemorial. And over the past 200 years, our literary tradition has been transcribed and translated and now appears in print form. We've printed, we've published almost 200 books, and yet nobody knows about it. These books aren't taught in schools. These books aren't available in bookstores. Um, so we have this really rich literary tradition, but nobody's studying it. Nobody's reading it. Nobody's um, talking about it. And so I really wanted to publish a book that helps honor and celebrate our literary tradition, and that helps honor and celebrate the women who were responsible for helping preserve and perpetuate that tradition. Let's talk about those women. Yeah. Tell so, us about the, the, about historically what were what were their their historical roles? Yeah, so traditionally our women um, were our culture keepers, our culture bearers, right? They were responsible for um, they were responsible for preserving and perpetuating our oral stories. And our oral stories um, contain cultural lessons and values that have guided our people um, for millennia. And women were always responsible for helping preserve and perpetuate these stories. But, um, you know, uh, colonization, war, um, dispossession, they interrupted that role that women traditionally played in tribal society. But what I argue in my book is that um, our women are, you know, they're they're resourceful and they're resilient and they found really creative and innovative ways to reimagine our oral stories as print literature. Um, that might be poetry, that might be a short story, that might be a novel, but they found really creative ways to keep our stories alive. And that's where, really what I'm trying to celebrate in, in this book. And so I look at three authors, um, Charles Eastman, who used his text, he was the first published Dakota writer, he used his text to preserve his grandmother's teachings. I look at Ella Deloria, who spent her entire life traveling across the country trying to preserve our oral stories and our languages for us. And I look at Elizabeth Cooklin, who is the founder of the Oak Lake, is one of the founders of the Oak Lake Writer Society. And 
did these really amazing things where she would reimagine our oral stories as poetry, as short stories, as novellas. And so I just really wanted to, you know, again, celebrate those women for sustaining our oral tradition, um, even today. Can you tell us a bit more, before we get more into the book, uh, mm -hmm. can you tell us a bit more about the title of the yeah. book? Yeah, um, the title of the book. So when I initially started writing this book, I had a really boring academic title for the book. I think it was something along the lines of colonizing and decolonizing Ocheti Shakuin literary tradition. And I was discussing the book with um, our mentor, Elizabeth Cook Lynn, and she said, you really need a title that is you know, powerful and that's gonna grab people's attention. And I remember a few days later, she called me and she said, I know what the title of your book should be. It should be, We Are the Stars. And that title is really appropriate. And I think it's appropriate because stars allude to our star narratives, which like I said, have guided us since time immemorial. Um, but it's also, I think really important, uh, really appropriate because that word stars, um, you know, it, it helps recenter Dakota women. We are the stars. We are the leaders of our own stories, right? Um, so I think We Are the Stars is a really appropriate story. But yeah, Li Elizabeth Cooklin came up with the title. And yeah, it's a way to honor our oral narratives, which still guide us today. But when you say We Are the Stars, can you unravel that a bit for us? Expand on that. Yeah, yeah. So um, the Ocheti Shakoin, um, our oral narratives are star stories. So Dakota people, their creation narratives tell them that they are star people who came to earth um, at a very specific site in Minnesota. And that's where, you know, uh, Dakota people and their ancestors emerged at Pedote, a specific spot at the confluence of the Minnesota and Mississippi rivers. Um, and so it's their create, it's Dakota people's creation story. Um, and so this, this title, We Are the Stars, refers to that creation story, um, which I also examined throughout the entire book. Um, because one of the things I was really trying to emphasize is that, you know, early missionaries said these creation stories were going to disappear, that they were, quote, going to go the way of the buffalo, meaning our oral stories were going to become extinct. And what I show in our, this book is that our women kept these stories alive. Um, and like I said, they reimagined them in very creative and different ways. And so these stories still exist today, both in oral and in print form, um, which is what the title is trying to acknowledge. We are the stars. We still have these stories. They're still alive and well in our communities and in our culture. I think it's worth pointing out that the buffalo didn't disappear either. It's no, it didn't. And that's a direct <laughs> quote from one of the missionaries. He said yeah. their language, their literature is going to quote, go the way of the buffalo. And that so so, really so maybe maybe they were right because the buffalo is still here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The <laughs> They're coming back. Um, mm -hmm. I want to remind our, our audience that uh, we have a chat and it, it's down at the bottom of your screen. You can click on that and then you can uh, if you don't have, let's say, if you're not really comfortable talking uh, on the Zoom, maybe you can put in your question or comment in the chat. And uh, you, you should look in there from time to time because Colby and, and uh, Carolyn and others are, are, are putting in links and things for you in, in the chat. And if you click on those little three dots that you'll see, you will be able to um, actually download the whole thing to your computer. Okay, so that's that's useful to um, remember. Let's talk about what you mean when you say that. Um, you know, when we talk about the importance of in the daily lives of Native people, and we talk about the importance of women. In that, give me some kind of idea of of what they were what they were doing. What how did they how did they do that? What was their their role actually? Uh, by you know they were the mother of our you know they played the role of wife and mother. They were nurturers. Um, they were you know um, both cultural and national leaders in our communities. 
um, our women, Elizabeth Cookman has a really great line in her book, Aurelia, and she says, our women were, um, which is, it's, our women were um, companions to men, mothers to children, um, feeders of the people, and keeper of the stories. And so those are the four main roles that women have traditionally played in our society. And I keep seeing this idea reimagined in each one of the texts that I um, analyze in my book. Um, Ochoti Shakoe women keep reimagining this role in a modern tribal context. And so it's still, you know, these responsibilities, they still exist today. Um, they might look a little different than they did in the past, right? But our women still play all of these important roles in our culture, in our community. And it's these roles that keep our culture, our language alive. Um, and so, yeah, women, they have always used stories to, you know, keep our culture and language alive and to make sure that exists for future generations. One of the observations I've had is that as a result of a, a concerted effort to knock off the men in these cultures during those, the, those uh, horrible wars, the women who were left were left actually are sort of with the responsibility, and I put that in the air quotes, um, for creating men because a lot of the people who were the, let's say the, 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 uh, the male roles were gone. It's not like every man was gone, but a lot of, of the men, anybody who was like fighting age kind of mm -hmm. got knocked off. And so there weren't a lot of roles. I'm curious as to how, you know, a woman who suddenly placed in that role how do they then go about um, creating men without male role models? And, and I say that with this one caveat also. It's not just philosophy that makes a man. It's not like something you tell him. It's like how he walks, the little subtle things that he does, even how he smells, mm -hmm. plays an impact on having you know, like having giving a, a, a boy something to like see himself in. How how do how did women? Yeah, you know, uh, it, I think before I answer that question, I want to provide a bit more historical context um, okay. because my book focuses primarily on the U.S. Dakota War of 1862, and after the um, you know U.S. Dakota War, our men were imprisoned in concentration camps in. Um, Minnesota, in Minnesota and Iowa, and our women were forcibly marched from their ancestral homelands in Minnesota to Crow Creek in South Dakota. And so when they arrived in Crow Creek, it was primarily women, children, and elders. And suddenly women had, again, that use that word responsibility, they had the responsibility of taking care of their families without their brothers, without their fathers, without their husbands. Um, they were forced, yeah, to find ways to take care of their families. And I think they did this in a couple of different ways. Like I said, I think the most important thing I try to emphasize in my book is that they continue to share those stories. Um, you know, they took our culture and their language. They had to take it underground um, because our people were being persecuted at this time. They took it underground, but they continued to share, you know, the knowledge and that tradition with their children. Um, and one of the things I try to emphasize in my book is I think, you know, the key to restoring our community, whether it be a man or a woman, is to remember those oral narratives and to remember the lessons embedded in those oral narratives. That's where we find our strength as Dakota people. That's where we um, are always going to find our strength in the language and the literature and the land. Um, and women are a key role of helping, yeah, preserve that. Well, I was kind of looking for the the effect of the change, and and, and you know, if it's not something that you you know like you sort of really worked on, that's okay. But I was yeah. I've always been curious as especially when I when I come in contact with uh, native men now, mm -hmm. especially boys, I often feel like okay, they like many other cultures where the men were knocked off. We could go back to Roman times and find the same thing happening to Europeans. Mm -hmm. When suddenly there are not the men who were the kind of, of 
rule setters, so to speak, if, if they weren't there, there was a certain kind of disarray and the people tried to accom you know, accommodate that, but it really was disrupting in terms of continuity of ideas. And so I'm just wondering how that has affected native people coming yeah. forward to today. Well, I think one thing I also want to distinguish is uh, or differentiate between is the fact that um, native societies are often matriarchal, right? They're matriarchal mm -hmm. in yeah. nature. And they've always been. And so, yes, it was a big blow when, you know, we lost a lot of our men to those internment camps. Um, but I think, yeah, one big difference between Western society and tribal society is that we've always been matriarchal and we've always looked toward our women to be the leaders. Um, of our communities. And so in the last chapter in my book, I do talk about Elizabeth Cooklin's novella, That Guy Wolf Dancing. And in that book, Liz talks kind of what you're referring to. She talks about the fact that, um, you know, our men are struggling after the U.S. Dakota War, after, you know, all of these dams were built and flooded the Crow Creek Reservation. She talks about the fact that our men struggled. And so that guy, Wolf Dancing, is about a young man who, um, you know, goes on a journey to um, discover himself, to, you know, strengthen and empower his community. And in that book, what she really emphasizes, again, is that it's going back to the stories and it's looking back toward our women. Um, that's where you're going to find, you know, your strength. And so she really emphasizes that, I think, really well in her book, That Guy Wolf Dancing. And that was, uh, that was her last novella as part of the Crow Creek series. So, yeah, I think that's a really good book to look at. Yeah, excellent. Well, I'm going to open it up uh, at this time to our esteemed audience and uh, panel here. Uh, do you, anyone have any uh, questions or comments that they would like to, to uh, add to our conversation? Just unmic yourself and start talking. Yeah, I'd like to comment. This is Lenico and I'd like to comment on the title. Um, oh, yeah, Lenico, your, your, your mic is kind of, of uh, low. Here. Yeah, yeah. I'm, we can kind of, I can kind of hear you, but it, you know. I'm sorry. Um, can you hear me better now? Yeah. I let you go. Yeah, no. Anyway, go ahead. Go right ahead. There. Anyway, what I wanted to say about the title was that, um, you know, some of us grew up realizing um, from the stories that we heard that we did come from the stars and part of our uh, experience here as humans is translating an understanding of what that means to be among our own in another setting, having uh, experiences and adventures as any human does. But then when we pass away, we return to the stars in our spirit journey. And so I thought the title was terribly appropriate because it's just so many things that um, comes to mind about our mythologies, our cosmologies, however, which way you want to identify that, um, how we see ourselves in this world. And a lot of indigenous tribes around the world have similar um, stories about coming here from the stars and returning upon our physical death. And uh, I'm just to cite a few are the Australian people, they're the indigenous there, and also the Hawaiians have the same um, story uh, experience. So it's nothing new. Um, it's just that it's not been a part of a way in which we interpret our, um, our presence as humans and our absence because of the way in which we have come and gone. Thank you, Lenico. Anyone else? Marcelo? I'm trying to figure out how to unmute. <laughs> you, you have unmuted. <laughs> uh, um, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm wondering about the oral history archives at the University of South Dakota, and I'm sure other universities too have oral history archives, and how much of those um, oral histories are um, dealing with 
those stories and whether or not those stories are being um, sort of brought back to life in print. Um, and I'll I'll mute my mic again. Thanks. Yeah. No, uh, these oral narratives are still, you know, very much alive. And, you know, I appreciate that they're also preserved in the archive. And then what I really want to, you know, what I really try to emphasize in the book is that they're still alive and well today and that our writers are still drawing on those stories um, when they reimagine their, you know, their literature as poetry. And so they still do very much exist today, um, both in, as I emphasize, both in oral and print form and, you know, electronic form where they're preserved in some of these archives, um, like you said, at USD and other places. So there's, there's the oral tradition is still very much alive today and these oral narratives are still very much alive today. So I do really try to emphasize that. It, I think it, it's, it's useful to mention that uh, writing is a, and reading is a relatively new thing in human history, mm -hmm. you know, and especially for most people. And originally writing wasn't designed to share information, it was designed to hide information. Mm -hmm. And you, when, because only certain people who had leisure time and discretionary income could sit around and figure out how to read and write. And so it was really off limits to most people. I, I bring this up sometimes in biblical uh, uh, discussions that most of the people during Moses' time could not read. You know, most of them. So, what was the point of writing it down on a tablet and showing it to them? They couldn't read it anyway. At least that's that's what that's what we understand from from history. So, yeah, one of the things that happens when you translate um, the oral histories is that the translation into print loses a lot of what the voice adds to the story. You know, mm -hmm. the inflection, intonation pausing they add a lot to the story once it's in print it's like this huge it's a very fine filter and so i'm wondering how that just you know despite the fact that you know there were intentions you know it, it, bad intentions but how does that play on keeping the history alive when just by definition lot is a lot is going to be lost yeah, no, I agree with that. A lot is lost. There's a big difference between the oral tradition and this new printed literature. And every one of the writers that I cite in my book also emphasize that, right, that there's something being lost in this translation, this transcription process. Um, but one of the things I did want to mention is, um, you know, you mentioned that writing was is relatively new. And for Dakota people, we uh, our relatives, they didn't begin writing until they were interned in those concentration camps in Minnesota and in Iowa. And suddenly writing became the only way that they could communicate with their family members. And so they didn't um, choose to start writing and to start communicating that way. They were forced to communicate that way. And so, um, yeah, writing is you know a fairly new um, tool, I guess you can call it, um, that Dakota people have used to preserve and perpetuate their culture and language. But I would also say that you know, what I argue in the book is that they do try and these writers have come up with creative and innovative ways to reclaim our stories. Um, you know, I think about Ella Deloria and she went back and she, the missionaries, when they first um, came to Dakota Territory, they started to collect, compile our oral stories and translate and transcribe them. And Ella Deloria, um, you know, 20 late maybe 50 years later, she came along and she corrected and retranslated all of those oral stories. And she wanted to do it from um, a cultural perspective. And so one of the things I talk about in the book is she worked her entire life to do this and then it was never published, right? It was never published. The missionaries had already staked their claim on the Dakota literary tradition. Their books have been published probably 15 times over the past 200 years. Deloria's books, her translations on the oral tradition are still um, in an archive at the Dakota Indian Foundation, haven't seen the light of day. And I argue that this is because missionaries, colonizers had already staked their claim on the literary tradition. And so I want to see, you know, Ella Delor the rest of Ella Deloria's work published. We have her really great, you know, novels, Water Lily, and her book, Speaking of Indians, but she has more oral stories in her archive that need and deserve to be published, and they just haven't been yet. So, so what's 
uh, what's the barnacles on those boats? You know, like what? I mean, it just seems like with the technology we have today, that's just yeah. a matter of will. So tell me about. Well, it is available uh, uh, electronically on an archive, um, but you. Well, have I mean, to... I mean, I mean, in print. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, print on it's... demand and stuff like that. So it's just yeah. a matter of, you have the stuff. What? What? Yeah. I'm just trying to figure out what. What is the holdup? Um, still today, I think the holdup for so many generations was um, people weren't publishing during Ella Deloria's time. She was publishing in the 1940. Um, American publishers certainly weren't publishing books by, you know, um, Native writers and even less by women. Um, and one of the things I talk about in my book is the reason she wasn't able to publish is because a lot of her white colleagues were using her research and publishing it themselves. And so you know, these books have already circulated. Um, I shouldn't say these books, translations, their Western versions of these stories have already been published. And so I think publishers are, yeah, they don't see the difference between Western and tribal translations. I think that's the big issue. But no, I do think I agree her work needs to be published and it will require an editor to, you know, go into the archive start engaging with her materials, get it to publishers. Um, so yeah, it will take yeah, some, you know, a scholar to do that. Yeah. Well, I think if we're waiting for the same people who've been denying you before to do that, then it's probably not going to happen. It would be it would be somebody who just says, "We're just going to publish this." Yeah. I mean, in these days, it's not even really a question of money. It's just a matter of like, will somebody sit down and uh, do the organizing of the book and put it out? You know. And and it sounds like a very important work that that deserves that kind of, we're gonna get it done um, yeah. approach. You know? And that's one of the things I argue in the book is that there are a number of women who are unpublished and still sitting in archives, right? Oh, Dakota, yeah. Lakota women, mm -hmm. um, and their work does need to be published. And yeah, it will take a lot of different people to pull that together, um, but we're starting to see it. We saw um, Emily Levine published Josephine Wagner's book recently. Um, and that, yeah, we've started to see more of Ella Deloria's work being published slowly. And yeah, other writers, um, Susan Bedelion, um, Josephine Wagner. So we're slowly starting to see it being published. And the next, we need to see it taught in schools. That's the next step. Not just get it published and have it circulated on the internet, but actually have it taught in our schools. Right. Can you talk a little bit about uh, circulating and getting it as part of the of the education system mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of material and you know given the amount of time that you know people have to do learn lots of things mm -hmm. um, this would not be either or but both and um, mm -hmm. i'm just wondering uh how um how is that how how could you see that happening yeah well, I think the Ochukti Shakuin Writer Society plays a big role in that, and I'm it's I, it's called the Oak Lake Writer Society, and we're starting to rebrand ourselves as the Ochukti Shakuin Writer Society. But um, we're working hard to try and get these resources into schools, and so I'm really glad to see so many Oak Lake members on here, Lenico and Gabrielle and Chuck. Um, we launched a new initiative called Native Reads: Great Books from Indigenous Communities, Stories of the Ochukti Shakuin. And what we wanted to do with this project is we wanted to create a recommended reading list of 10 books that we think are critical and foundational to our community. Like I said, um, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota people have published 200 books over the past two centuries, but they're not taught in schools. Um, and so we wanted to create an easy resource where we could tell people, okay, here are 10 books that really tell you about our community. And so we created this, um, these 10 books, and then we created educational resources to go around with these, to go along with these books. We created a literary timeline. We created discussion guides. We created a podcast series where we interview these authors and we interview their relatives so that teachers and students um, have more resources they can use in the classroom to engage with Ocheti Shakui literature in a culturally relevant and a meaningful way. And so I'm so happy to see that we now have um, the, the link to the Native Reads educational brochure up on the screen. Um, but there are a number of other links where we've created, like I said, discussion guides, um, interviews, um, and I, I believe Colby is going to put those links in the chat, but 
we have started to create, you know, those resources because we do want to see these books taught in school. Um, I mean, I think it's incredibly important for Native students to see themselves and their communities positively reflected in textbooks and in curricula, um, because I certainly didn't have that experience. And I know a lot of our writers in the Oteti Shakuin um, writing group didn't have that experience either. Um, and so we're hoping that this Native Read campaign will help increase awareness of our, you know, of our rich literary tradition. You know, this, uh, seeing uh, the Native Reads reminds me, I mean, its importance reminds me of, a, of an interesting conversation I had years ago in West Africa. I was called over to talk to one of the chiefs who wanted to meet me because I was, you know, one of the folks in, the, in his, his village. And uh, so I, he, he asked me through a translator to, to, to talk, to tell him about the experience of Black Americans in the United States. And so that was many years ago, but I went on a, let's say, a rant about how, you know, how badly we were treated because this was like still in the, you know, late 70s. Uh, and and historically, how badly we were treated, and and I I added that they don't teach us our history. And he immediately says, "Wait, wait, 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 wait. Why would you want somebody who hates you to teach you your history?" Mm -hmm. <laughs> that that caused a mind shift and 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 a whole uh, let's say energy shift to like, no, that's not their responsibility. It's my responsibility uh, it, it, to go and find it because those people are never gonna, they, they're gonna try to keep it from me. So I, it's my responsibility to do that, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm glad to see that you guys are taking that and uh, let's say riding that horse. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that's the really great thing about the Native Reads Project is it is a Native-led, Native-curated project. Um, the project was completely funded by Native nonprofits. Uh, First Nations Development Institute, the Ochepti Shakuin Writer Society worked on it. Um, the Red Nation worked on it. Um, a Hopi consulting firm helped us um, you know, design all of the materials. And so it's a completely Native-led, Native-curated resource. And so the Oak Lake writers really work together to carefully select and, you know, to read and select these books. And so I think that's one of the things we're really proud about um, with, you know, with these resources is that they come from the community. Uh, Marta is asking uh, if you can speak to what you found were the ways that the stories were able to be carried forward in spite of the tremendous effort to stomp them out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, meaning like the specific stories, I guess. Well, in other words, how did how did people do it? I mean, do you sit around and tell campfires, you know, uh, campfires, or do you like tell kids, or do you, you know, do you do you paint pictures, or do you, you know, have like uh, dance theatrics? How 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 is that information? Oh. Yeah, they tell stories, right? they share stories among family members and community members, and it's passed down, you know, orally that way. Um, and then, again, I think our women started to think about um, how can we preserve these stories as literature, and so then they begin um, reinterpreting them as poetry, as, like I said, short stories, as novellas. But yeah, traditionally, it's passed down from family to family, community to community, um, orally. Okay. Marta and and Marcella have their hands up. Marta, you want since we're talking about you, you want to you want to unmute and ask your question. Thank or, you. I I just wanted to clarify a little bit about my question. Okay. I understand your research was about a specific time period, and um, I, you know, my very small understanding of that time period was that um, you know the efforts to stop families communicating to stop. Um, parents communicating with children to stop um, elders communicating, you know, with the rest of their family group were really, really severe. And I just wondered, you know, you talked about how they had to go underground to do that kind of communication. And um, I feel like that oral tradition of storytelling must be a very close personal kind of relationship where you sit down with your grandma and you hear the story literally on her lap. 
So how does one do that kind of storytelling when you're literally being ripped apart from your family? How do you save those precious, precious values that are shared through those stories? Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, you're right. That's what boarding schools were intended to do, right? Extinguish our language, our culture, our literature. And in a lot of ways, it was successful. So, you know, speaking personally, I never had the opportunity to sit on my grandmother's lap and hear these oral stories. Um, but I know that there are a lot of families that did. And that's why these stories are still alive today. They did go underground and they did, um, you know, share them with their children, with their grandchildren. Personally, I didn't have, you know, I wasn't able, I didn't have that experience, unfortunately, because of colonization and because of the devastation, you know, caused, um, caused that way. But people and families did it and they shared it orally and they shared it in the traditional language. And so it does still exist today. And I think it's such a gift that there are writers willing to share that knowledge, um, you know, in their printed literature. Were, were you able, Sarah, to talk to any first person um, kind of experiences and, and hear how people did hear those stories well, passed to them? I think being part of the Oak Lake Writers Society, that often comes up in our discussion, right? People reflect fondly on their families, their communities, the stories they've heard. But I never explicitly sat down with somebody and, you know, played the role of anthropologist and said, you know, what stories were you told? How were you told, you know, how were they told to you? Um, we, we never had those specific conversations, but I think um, organically we talked about those things um, in our discussions at the society. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Marcella, you had uh, something to add to our conversation. Yeah, I had a question. Thanks, Sarah, for sharing with us um, your, your background and your information today. You have talked about the resources and how those Native Reads resources are all Indigenous-led, Indigenous-produced works by and for other Native folks. And so my question is, I think probably a little bit prickly, but thinking about, um, you mentioned the Gloria's work and that there's this whole archive of material that could be brought, I don't wanna say brought to life because it's already there, but that could be brought to light maybe for, for other people. And I wonder if you have any thoughts on the value of whether or not that those works need to continue to be brought forward solely by indigenous folks or if there was value, say there was a graduate student, a white graduate student who found value in wanting to bring those things forward. I mean, would that even make sense or, or not? You know, uh, one of the things I think about in my own research is that our language and our literature has been, um, you know, often exploited, published by graduate students, by scholars to make a name for themselves as academics. Um, and so I think you know, we just made really huge strides with the Native Reads Project, where for the first time in almost, you know, two centuries, Native people have taken control of their literature and their stories. And I want to see, in a lot of ways, I want to see that continue on, where our own people um, have control of our literary traditions. Now, that doesn't mean that non-Natives can't or won't study um, our literature, but I think they can collaborate with Native people to do that, um, you know, in a positive way. But no, I mean, I, I, you know, I just, I think what really just makes me so happy is that it's Native people who are helping lead this right now. And I think it's time, right? A lot of those early um, academic studies did a lot of damage to our culture and to our communities. Um, so I really do think it's time after 200 years for, you know, citizens of tribal nations, of sovereign tribal nations to take control of their literature and their language. That creates an that creates an interesting uh, uh, conundrum, so to speak, mm -hmm. because um, valuing it very much what you're saying, you know, like, okay, people need to take control of their narrative. And mm -hmm. then you have a person who wants to do something in air quotes. They want to be play an active role. But that active role that hasn't really been defined. I mean, something that people can actually do. It hasn't been defined. I would say that that is something that the same native writers could do is define that role. But as far as I can see, that role isn't clearly defined. So it yeah. almost 
it almost sidelines the people who who would want to do something positive. I'm not quite sure how we'd handle that. I think we need to start asking ourselves what it really means to be an ally, right? Um, being an ally doesn't mean just taking um, our language, our culture, and like I said, using it to make a name for yourself in graduate school or to get yourself a degree. It's really about collaborating. And, you know, I have a lot of non-Native students at University of New Mexico, and they often ask this question too, how can I um, engage with Native literature in a meaningful way where I'm not exploiting it further, where I'm not doing more damage? And so I think asking that question is an important first step, and I think we're still trying to figure it out. Um, but yeah, I think there is a way that we can collaborate, but um, yeah, again, I just, I don't want to take away from the idea that this is one of the first times, right, that after 200 years where we've come together and we've tried to promote that literary tradition, and I'm glad that we have allies who are willing to help us, and I think, you know, we have one of our really strong allies here on the call today is Dr. Woodard. Dr. Woodard is a Native, but he created this platform, the El Chete Shakuin Writer Society, to help elevate our voices. And so I think that's the meaning of a, you know, of a good ally, of a strong ally. So I don't think it's a matter of, oh, non-Native people can't write about Native people at all. I don't think that's, you know, that's the issue, but we have to start thinking about how we can collaborate and how, you know, non-Native people can help elevate those voices. Right. And there, there are other things to do besides actual doing the writing and translating. I mean, there's a lot of pieces to the puzzle to you know to to get that get that uh, message and those stories out there and to create opportunities for uh, native people to uh, to tell their story as opposed to having someone say well let me tell this, tell you the story that was told to me to me that's the last resort is like to tell your story especially for people who are still developing their voice because their voice was cut before I think it has to have an incubation period. It has to have a way, a time at which people say, okay, now that we we have uh, legs a little bit, where will we go? You know, now that we can walk, where will we go? And that takes time, you know, it just it just does. Tara, you you look like you're anxious to uh, to add something to our conversation. Uh, thank you very much, Lawrence. Um, I just had a question also about that as a white parent to Native children and my role in trying to help them to cultivate their culture and the best way to go about that. And also as a director of a public library and bringing it in, I brought in um, the Dakota Daughters talking about Wounded Knee. We've read the Seed Keeper. We read um, last year's book as far as one book, South Dakota's. But when I do have those programs as well, it's a bunch of um, women 40 years old and up that are sitting around talking about it. And I've always said that I'd love to have um, that Native aspect as well to, to bring that in and have those voices heard. And I, I feel like I try my best, you know, to help with the language and the correct pronunciation because I myself tried to learn it as well to try to teach that and to speak that with my children to instill the the culture as well and to keep that alive um, so I just wonder what the best way for me as a parent and also a city employee and a public library to to move forward in that ally position but also um, trying to cultivate understanding and sensitivity and learning as well so yeah no that's a great question and you know one thing I would also recommend is uh, as part of the Native Reads program we also established um, a list for young adults for youth and so we have a list of five books that we think are um, you know would really benefit um, Native youth to learn about the culture and the language. And so our group thought about all age groups, not just adults or college children, but there's a link to another list of books. I think there are five books on, um, on that list and they're, they're slipping me now, but I know one of them is Peta Shows Misu the Light by Jesse um, Taking a Live Ren Counter. There's um, Virginia Driving Hawks Navies. Um, my father was an Indian and a cowboy, and I, the other ones are slipping my mind right now. Yeah. But there's a list of five books, and I think those are, you know, a good starting point for some of some younger children. And then also just 
connecting children with community members. And I think about my own experience. Like I said, I didn't grow up on the reservation. And although I'm really close to my mom, my mom's family, um, because of colonization, we didn't fluently speak our language. We didn't practice our cultural traditions. And so, like I said, when I got to college, that's when I started learning more um, about our literary tradition. And it was through books, right? It was through these books that our literary ancestors left behind for us. Charles Eastman, Zakala Shah, Elizabeth Cook Lynn. Um, you know, in these books, they left behind um, lessons, you know, to help guide us. And so personally, I turned to books. And then I think my saving grace was the Oak Lake Writer Society that, um, you know, the, reconnecting with the community that way that has been, yeah, really helpful. And I think it made my book that much better. So yeah, ways to reconnect children with the community. Thank you. Thanks. I want to remind folks that uh, we, all of these uh, links, et cetera, people's uh, comments and when they have them, questions, uh, they are in the chat. And again, you, if you go on to the open up the chat, it's a little box down at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And if you open it up and then you uh, look, you'll see a little smiley face and right next to the smiley face, at least that's the way it appears online. There are three little dots. You click on those little dots and one of the options that you will have in that drop down menu is to download all of that to your computer because trying to type it out or remember it can be kind of tricky. Yeah. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the power of the book, right? There's writing and then there is the book. And I think both of those deserve uh deserve some exploration because if we're we're talking about going from ex from um, uh, oral uh, tradition and how people genetically really translate their program when we're born we're programmed to do language we already we can learn a language we don't need a dictionary or a teacher or anything we pick up a language writing not so much okay so it means that I often say uh, reading is an unnatural act. You know, we're not born to read. We have to learn to read. And it's a strenuous processing thing for the brain to do. I like to explore what's, what's the payoff? What's the power of the book? What's the thing that the book brings that is uh, that adds something or is more important than the oral tradition? Because we're switching now. Yeah, well, I think one of the things I'd say first is that for me, reading was so natural, like, <laughs> I'm such a nerd, and I was such a bookworm as a child, like, I always loved reading. Um, and then, you know, I think one of the things I always tell my students is I tell them, you know, books are incredibly important, um, because they have the power to shape how we see ourselves, how we see our communities, but they also have the power to shape how the rest of the world sees and engages with us. Um, so I always think about that when I think about books. We can't just think of them as, you know, boring textbooks that have no consequences or no meaning. Um, I think words, whether they're oral or they're spoken, they have a profound impact on each one of us, right? Like I said, they shape how we see ourselves, they shape how we see our communities, and they shape how others see and engage with us. And that's one of the things I talk about in my book is that um, this transition from the oral tradition to English language literary literacy had a profound impact on our people. The book was used to colonize our people, but now we're seeing our people use the book using the written words to decolonize um, our people and our families and our communities. And I don't know if that answered your question or- Well, I mean, I, I, I find value in that, but I was really looking for, there are some structural things that, that writing does that that the oral tradition let's say goes lacking you know for example permanency you know mm -hmm. we know that over time different people have different takes and as you indicated they reimagine the story and mm -hmm. i find this in lots of kinds of literature i'm doing a program now on uh, uh asian ghost stories and that's one of the things i'm finding there it, it was originally oral tradition and now people are writing them they're even making movies about them but they change and they change depending on where they go from one area of japan for example to another and people have a different little twist on it to make a little different point the book 
when you write, when you print something, it creates a, a static record that you can refer back to where this was the last original thing. So there's some permanency that, you know, and it has pluses and minuses, but but there it's different. And yeah, so there well, are those kind of things. Yeah, I think I, I mean, I agree with that. Like I said, the first way that I started to learn more about my culture and my community was by reading the books that our literary ancestors left behind. So I agree with that, that there is a permanency to it. I also just always want to be really careful that we don't privilege the written word over the oral word, uh, you know, over the spoken word, because like I said, the oral tradition still very much exists today. And I think there tends to be a stereotype that the oral tradition, especially among Indigenous people, is extinct, but it does still exist today. Um, you know, people do still have access to it. And like I said, they are still reimagining it in the printed word. But yeah, no, I mean, like I said, books are the first way I started learning, you know about my culture and community. Right, and as a dyslexic, I'm glad that you, you mentioned that, you know, talking is, you know, that's what we do, you know, as humans, and still most of the information that we get is still orally, you know? I mean, if even if you go to like um, advertising, they have all of these things, spend billions of dollars, but then finally they say, well, the best thing, is, all we're trying to do is, is encourage word of mouth. We, we, we're trying to encourage people to talk about it because that's where people, that's where the rubber meets the road for most people's reality is like, you know, that's why this program is, exists is because we recognize that it's important for people to have conversations about different things and wrestle with ideas. Not that you can't do that with books, but the books to me end up being like the catalyst to get the things started. So and that's really important. But then finally we have to have conversations, you know, and 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 make it part of something that we we value. Yeah. And I like that that it's a catalyst. I agree with that. I think that's very true. Well we're coming up at the end of our time now. Uh, we only have about two or three minutes left. Can you leave us with some some parting thoughts of let's say some things that you would like us to take away from, uh, if you had one or two things that we took away from this conversation, what would that be? One or two things to take away from this conversation. Um, gosh, I think there's so much to take. It was a really long and in-depth conversation. No, I think, you know, the thing I really want to leave people with is, um, you know, like I said, the Ocheti Shakoween, we have a long and rich and complicated literary tradition and it's still alive and well today. And I think it's important for, um, you know, people in South Dakota and Minnesota to know that history. Um, I think once we start learning that history and we start having these conversations, as you said, we can, you know, start to heal, start to decolonize. But I think we're still very much in the early phases of that. Hopefully what my book does is it helps educate audiences about that history and the history that does need to be discussed. Great. Well, this has been a very interesting conversation. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, for all of us here who are, are, uh, have the privilege of having um, had this conversation with you, that we can take something that is, will be useful and help us to bridge a gap, become better allies, to have more connection. And for me, actually, I, I'm not really in favor of that allies thing. I, I like to have uh, personal connections with people and not see them as a one block, you know, as that they all have to be the same thing. So even though it's a semantical thing, but I, I'm always looking to have something more personal, but it will start with these kind of conversations. It will start with saying, oh yeah, maybe there's something I don't know. Maybe there's something that I could, another way that I could engage with people. And if nothing else, just lower the resistance, so to speak, to just sitting down and having a conversation and including a person who's not from our culture in our culture and, and bring them into our, our families and, uh, and, and exploring them and their culture through them as a living thing as opposed to something that's that's static and dead 
thank you very much for your uh, joining us. You're going to be at the book fair, right? Yeah, I'll be at the book, book festival. festival. September, yeah. Okay, so yeah, so uh, we'll invite everybody and and uh, uh, Jennifer. She didn't get a chance to get a plug, but the the book festival is coming up pretty soon. So uh, sharpen your, uh, you know. It's out in West River, so if you're in East River, you know, check your carburetors and batteries. Make all make sure all that works, so we can get out there. Uh, and then maybe we can have a conversation. Are you going to present your book there? Yeah, yeah, I okay. believe, yeah, I'm going to present the book there. Okay, great. And then that that way we'll have a chance to those of us who go to the book fair will uh, festival will be able to have a conversation with you, and there tends to be a few other people who are writing the same kind of genre of books. And so maybe we can have conversations. You will have a breakout session, I imagine. Um, are you talking to me or? <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know. I don't entirely know the format, but I do hope. Oh, Jennifer, do Jennifer, Jen the, uh, we're having a, 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 an opportunity for, for uh, people who write that genre to have a conversation with people. Yeah, uh, we will definitely, Sarah will have a, a solo session where she will talk about her book and answer questions and do that kind of thing. And then there will be probably at least one other um, either panel or duo event. And in addition to that, we've got quite a few other um, sessions, which are either panels or solo events with writers from different genres that will deal with um, tribal writing and tribal history and, you know, different projects, as well as sort of a special section of, of uh, programs that deal with the missing and murdered Indigenous persons issue. Um, so I think we'll, we'll have a lot there. But yeah, Sarah, you know, is being put on the spot because I haven't actually shared her schedule with her yet. But that will be coming soon. It will be up on online as, as soon as we iron out a few more kinks, because sometimes those kinks pop up after you think it's all done. Yeah. So, yes, you right. will have a chance to hear from Sarah at least twice at the festival. Great. Well, that wraps up our time. Thank you, everyone, for showing up, and we'll see you next week. Same time, same station.